Y. Well, tonight, we're on the move with K for Kinetic. Let's meet Motormouth Danny Baker. Thank you. Thank you. Speed freak Marcus Brickstock. <laughs> go, go, girl Joe Brand. <laughs> and poetry in motion Alan Davis. <laughs> Let's hear your beats, bruvs. Danny goes. I like to move it. Yeah! <laughs> like to move it. <laughs> Marcus goes. I got the move. Ooh, ooh, I got the move. And Alan goes. Kinema was originally what cinema was called, mm -hmm. from the same word as kinetic. It was a kinematic moving, a moving picture. Well, kinetic, of course, means anything to do with movement, so for heaven's sake, let's get moving. Uh, where will this get me? I'm going to find my broom here. If I were to move my hands together like this, what would happen? Whether I did this one a bit more than that one, or that one a bit more than that one, what would happen at the end, well, that, when my hands met? The heavy end would fall down. No. It certainly, <laughs> when you do this, you will always find it meets at the centre of gravity. Oh. Always. Because the resistance yeah, from exactly. the heavy so end as long as you're just sort of oh, doing it without thinking, that. you know, it just meets up like that. Oh. And it balances. Doesn't actually look right. a very natural Try it. Got... implement in your hand. No. <laughs> <laughs> you got one. Maybe it'll look more natural than yours. Yeah, I um... have. <laughs> <laughs> you can home tonight. <laughs> Here we go. You've all got one, so try it. <laughs> Obviously. You think this fell apart? Everybody except Alan. <laughs> now try properly. <laughs> Obviously, the left hand won't work. <laughs> 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 is it working for you, Marcus? Please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, yeah no, Joe isn't even it does, trying. It does. No, well, oh, I can you tell go. you, there are women all over the country going, look at the silly bastards, we've got to clean the floor with it. <laughs> oh, man, it's I've not... been trying this all afternoon and I can't make it do anything else. No! It's, like Uri... it's got a Uri Geller touch about it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, that's this really disappointing. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm completely astounded. <laughs> We're all very disappointed. <laughs> Every single person who's is, tried this. Is there any money in it doing it wrong? Huh? <laughs> Close your eyes. <laughs> Sir, that's good. You found this under gravity perfectly, though. <laughs> the thing is, you're tilting it, Danny. No, right, I'm not, no, no, no. I promise you, I'm trying you're to tilt it. Ah. <laughs> 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 that's working perfectly. <laughs> Oh, last time, last time, last time, last time. It's level, yes? Yeah. Level. It's going, I can feel it. it's going. Ah! Hey! 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 <laughs> and error. this, now that's interesting. Why do you think you can balance it with the centre of gravity so high? Because we know what the centre of gravity because is. Because I'm a genius! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But if you try and do that from the bottom end, but not grasping the brushes, literally just balancing on your palm, It'll just fall over. Not, you must grasp it. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I, That's really good, actually. Yes. <laughs> I think the, the show is broom techie. You might need a word <laughs> after the program. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, my science elves. Exactly. For all the <laughs> moments of inertia yeah. and your centres like of mass. This game's brilliant because you don't need to be clever. <laughs> Just needs a variety of room related <laughs> tricks. <laughs> well, centre of gravity is the issue there, isn't it? Yeah. I've discovered by Archimedes, supposedly. Did anyone other... hear him speak, Archimedes? Would it just. He <laughs> <laughs> did sound as if it coming through dense undergrowth. It's <laughs> a man in the bushes. No, it's me. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> Behind you, there's a man in the bushes. No, it's true, it's me speaking. <laughs> Um, anyway, listen, um, the idea is that you will always find the centre of gravity of a broom as you zoom your hands together. <laughs> Try it at home. Jesus, good God. Um, so, now, here's a tricky bit of maths for you on a centre of gravity related theme. I'm six foot four and a half feet tall yeah. and weigh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christ. <laughs> I thought I had every copy of that collected. The track of the 50 foot Stephen. Um, anyway, yes, nice. I am uh, six foot four and a half inches tall and I weigh. A little bit over 14 stone, between 14 stone and something more than 14 stone. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> how much would I weigh if I was 44,000 miles tall? Keeping <laughs> <laughs> the exactly. same ratios and proportions. Yeah, it? yeah. How much would I weigh? Oh. Well, there, there'd come a point where you'd the top part of your extraordinary body would <laughs> no longer be affected by Earth's gravity, so 
you'd weigh a bit less than one might expect, but still a fair amount, I would think. No, I'd actually, <laughs> I'd actually be weightless, because my central gravity would be I'll outside... I'll be beyond the halfway yeah, point. Yeah, oh. it would be in orbit. How long would your penis be? <laughs> it would depend strikingly. <laughs> Grand Canyon would have to worry. <laughs> Like the Isle of Skye, wouldn't it? <laughs> you could change the tides. I mean, if you, if you were weightless but, but lying across the top, yeah. then, then the penis could be affected by gravity whilst you weren't. <laughs> <laughs> We've just done the calculations, uh, oh. and my penis would be 3,384 miles long. <laughs> Thank you. Which means we can do the division again. We can figure out really how big it is. Too much information, I think. It would be poking out of your dress as well. <laughs> you have had a ball gown. Uh, literally. Uh -oh. <laughs> There was a... Uh, I think we talked about this before, Anna. There was a, a proposal made in the 19th century to build a, a tower that went out into space as a way of getting out there, which seems ridiculous, in fact, but it would use the same principle if it was anchored to the ground and then went up high enough. Its centre of gravity would be in orbit and so it would be sort of weightless, but absolutely rigid and stable. But here's the thing while we're in space. This made me space out uh, about a year ago when I realised that nobody knows which way this planet is up. That's right. We Australians... Uh, uh, yeah. You can buy in Australia globes with Australia on yeah. the top. Because we don't go up and down, we don't know what If a UFO approaches, there's no particular reason no. why it should approach uh, with the North Pole at the top. I think, though, if they came all this way, they'd be fairly unlikely to go to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> this programme has been raised in Australian Parliament. Yeah? Yeah, someone said, why is the Australian taxpayer? Yeah. You know, not paying for homemade Australian entertainment, but paying for wall-to-wall -wall bloody Stephen bloody fry. <laughs> It's you like you like you are. time. Apologise. Uh, you don't have to watch this. Like, just... uh, no, we love we love it that we're so popular in Australia, don't we? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Very nice. Um, <laughs> how do we get there? Um, I'm talking to an astronaut, believe it or not, <laughs> two months ago. Uh, a British astronaut. He's been up three times into the station. A very expensive phone call. That it was. Yeah, <laughs> Mike Bowles. Uh, yeah. And uh, I mean, just it, it makes it, yeah, what a life. And he's been up three times. And he said the most important thing is, he said, because they're doing uh, repairs on the outside of the craft and. They have to keep listening just for one message. There's no talking back and forth because they have to say, gentlemen, two minutes to sun up because there's about eight different sun ups as they go around. Mm -hmm. And he said it's like a nuclear explosion. He said it's the one thing you have to remember. Uh, he said visors down every time because it would. There's nothing you. to filter it, is there's it? There's nothing. Yeah. It would come straight yeah. at you. Like he said. And also the space suit while we're there, I couldn't ask, I'll ask dumb questions. Are they off the peg because they all look yes, the same? Or are they, he said, <laughs> no. He said the suit itself costs £35 million. Pounds. What? They're each all, one? They're all, each one. I know a chap tailored. on German it's... Street that'll no. do <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, you can get them in TK Maxx. I mean, they're. <laughs> And he said, no, you don't go and pick them up. You are measured for it for wow. about two years beforehand. It'd be quite cross if you suddenly stacked a load of weight on just before. <laughs> I don't know how that would work. We've made it. Sorry, I've been to a wedding, had a hell of a weekend. <laughs> good, good nuggets of fact there. Thank you, Jenny. Now, what's the most interesting thing you can do with a hole, a stick and a Greek? <laughs> yes. There's quite a few Greek men I'd like to put in a hole and hit with a stick. <laughs> From the holidays. Oh, oh. Right. <laughs> no. Do you know the one in the middle? Who, what, Do you know who that Greek is? Man. Yeah. No, I didn't go it... out with a boy. <laughs> no. As you can tell by the photograph, he's now actually a man. Right. Uh, Prince Zorba. Philip. It is Prince, Prince Philip. Philip. Oh, well done. This is surprising. Did you get something right? <laughs> Phil the Greek. Phil the Greek. Exactly. Where's his arms gone? <laughs> <laughs> arms were added later. Did he gain the Duke of Edinburgh? Well, when... <laughs> oh, and they put on a royal coat of arms. Ah! ah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, he's, um, he's nine years old there. He's going to hike this headscarf. I hate it. <laughs> he's going for a national costume. There's a hole in case you want to know what one looked like. Uh, and there's a stick in case you want to know what one looked like. But there was a Greek who did something pretty amazing just with the hole in the stick. Can you think of anything that you might do? Was it hide their sovereign debt? <laughs> <laughs> there is no hole big enough. Yeah, he's a very old Greek. He, he pretty old. Eratosthenes, his did name he, was. Did he drop a stick down a hole? He looked down a hole at a particular time of year. Was it at Christmas? Exact opposite. Christmas is the winter solstice. Right. Summer, Summer solstice. solstice. OK, if you looked at the bottom of the well at exactly noon on a solstice, he saw no shadows whatsoever. Oh, dear. And he worked out with extraordinary cunning he knew the distance from there to another place, 500 miles away. And at exactly the same time, he put a stick in the ground and the sun was at an angle oh, gotcha. of 7.2 degrees from overhead. Okay. So he worked out from this information that the Earth's circumference had to be 25,000 miles. And so he worked it out using a stick in the ground. 
In fact, we now know the, it, the actual figure to be 24,859. Sure, that's Idiot. how close you are. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. and so he's a margin of error of less than 1%, yeah. with no technology wow. other than a stick. I think that's pretty astonishing. Yeah. Eratosthenes was the librarian of the great uh, Library of Alexandria, which is considered the greatest repository of knowledge in the ancient world. And he was a musician, an astronomer, a poet. He invented the term geography, mathematician, obviously. He was known as Beta because he was the second best at every discipline in the world that was known at the time, which is pretty astonishing. That is. He was a great man. And his dates were around about uh, the 200-ish BC. Anyway, that was the great um, Eratosthenes who measured the Earth with a stick. What would happen if the Earth suddenly stopped spinning? We'd all fly off it. Oh! oh no. Marcus, 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 Marcus. Marcus. <laughs> we wouldn't fall off, no. Oh, there'd be numerous consequences. There would. <laughs> <laughs> numerous consequences. Well, half of the world would be plunged into eternal darkness. That's a very good point. And they would all leave and come and join the light side. <laughs> or would some of them go to the dark side? Ah. It would change the very nature of human life on the planet, but from the dark to the light people. <laughs> What but about the animals? All the ones who like the dark, they'd have to get to the dark side. All the moths would have to go All the over. moths would have to go that way. <laughs> the butterflies would have to go that way. The moles would be really confused. <laughs> what about on daybreak, when they start broadcasting? <laughs> Do they confusing. know when to start daybreak? <laughs> <laughs> The weather would be substantially changed. I should imagine the weather would be enormously be floods, changed. Big floods, big floods and... Um, the seas would come to an enormous... Tsunami, yeah. and earthquakes. Pestilence. Pestilence, Rain. yes, exactly. <laughs> As moans will be heard over the face of the deep. And, and your mobile wouldn't work. If you don't be able to grow food on half of the world, the other half would have to come to the light side for food. They could have mushrooms and, and, yeah, and rhubarb. They would only be able to have fungi. I'd live on yes. that side. And what time would the four horsemen of the apocalypse turn? <laughs> yes, the sound of the last trumpet. Do you, th do you think they'd book an appointment, the four horsemen? Go, well, we will be round. You'll have to be in between eight and seven. <laughs> <laughs> is it the lights? <laughs> well, the point is the Earth spins at about a thousand miles an hour at the equator. It's slower at the poles, obviously. I remember my father explaining to me how the edges of a record were going faster than the bits in the middle. I said, that's not, that's not possible. How could that be? He said, well, how could it not be? Yeah, you know? like when you slam a door. Yeah. The end bit's going very, very fast. Yeah. The other bit that yeah. drops your finger on the inside. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely right. So Get if two it children, stopped, would you... one there. That's different in the same time. <laughs> would, you, would you fall over? You'd certainly fall over. The point is, the Earth spins at about a thousand miles an hour, as I said, at the equator. It would have to be almost 17 times more than that to defeat the effect of gravity. We would just scrape along the ground at a thousand miles an hour. And we'd, you know, good to have shares in Savlon because we'd have... All right, and if and I scraped bruises. along the ground at a thousand miles an hour, I'd kill a load of old ladies. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be pleasant, but what we couldn't do is have enough force to go over the atmosphere. If it slowed down over a number of years, we might not notice. Well, there is that. Yeah. That would be very interesting. I started writing a book about exactly this. <laughs> and then, and then, yeah, and then, and then my... Was it called uh, The Decade the Earth Stood Still? It was, it, was, no, it, was called, it was called The 25th Hour, and I was really thrilled with it as an idea. It was just the idea that uh, some comet went past, the science was very fudged, and it slowed the rotation of the Earth, so we ended up with 25 hours. And to begin with, everyone knew what to do with their extra time. And then the banks got hold of it, and they went, no, we'll just make everyone work. But it turned out time available was sitting perfectly balanced against greed. And when you increased one, it all, it all collapsed. Anyway, same, <laughs> same thing got published by someone else for a record fee in the same month I came up with it. Oh, yeah. well, At least that's what my publisher told me. <laughs> <laughs> very, very trustworthy chap. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, the fact is you wouldn't fly off, although it's a compelling image. You'd just scrape along the ground and probably bump into things. Um, now, what travels the wrong way along a motorway at 12 miles per hour? <laughs> yes, baby. There's an elderly man in a Morris mine. <laughs> 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 no, it's one of those motorised wheelchairs. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Oh! <laughs> 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 Both going for the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, this is a, an effect we might all have experienced on motorways, and a deeply unpleasant one, and yet a perplexing one. There was a wonderful New Yorker cartoon which showed a, a huge traffic jam, and a man looking in a puzzled way at a sign that said, traffic jam clears inexplicably three miles ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's the phenomenon we're looking at if you drive. You know that sometimes you can be in this terrible traffic jam, and then it will magically clear. Yeah. No, no cones, no police, there's never yeah. not been anything wrong, and you think, well, what was that about? And there's a science which is like fluid dynamics, but they use things called uh, kinematic wave equations. And what happens is a car will suddenly brake, and the car behind it will brake, the car behind it will break, and so on and so on, and so it sends a ripple effect back through the traffic. Oh, yeah. And the one ahead can start off again quite cheerfully, say, like, oh, it was only a pigeon diving up my windscreen. But the other ones are still slowing down, and they continue to, going backwards. There you see them backing up. And they continue to back up for quite long distances, wow. while the ones ahead are free. But they discover that pulse, that backwards, of braking travels on average about 12 miles an hour. And oh, can right. cause big Presumably, jams. you get the same effect when there's a police car in the slow lane doing 60. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so annoying. Everyone, uh, doing 60. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if I just. I bet, I bet police love that. Do you ever okay. get. Oh, look, he's going 71, shall yeah. we? Yeah. Shall we? <laughs>
But, uh, of course, we know nothing of traffic jams in this country. Which country is the absolute heroic epicentre of the traffic jams, of all traffic jams? I would think India. Uh, no, it's China. Oh, China right. has epic, I mean, epic traffic jams. They had one in 2010 that was over 80 miles long, and it moved on average less than a kilometre a day. I'm not kidding you. That's how bad it was. And they're so bad regularly that they now have quite profitable services where you call up uh, this service and they, they arrive on a motorbike, two people on a motorbike, one gets in and takes your place in the traffic jam oh. and you get on the back and the other one drives you through the traffic. But can you imagine? Do people bring you things like when you get a phone, a pizza and that? Probably. <laughs> they're an enterprising people, Chinese, I should imagine so. But it would be very difficult. I suppose if you bought the pizza on the, on the motorbike, you'd be all right. But it'd be quite frustrating to order the pizza. You know, we're just we're at the lights, so we're, <laughs> we're four days away. <laughs> I was quite impressed. I went to Las Vegas last year, and they have um, uh, those, uh, those billboard trucks that say yes, they yeah. can deliver a hooker to your room in 25 minutes. <laughs> but, but the pizza still takes half an hour. <laughs> so, so what I've worked out is that you could, if you had the resources, get the hooker to pick up the pizza for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. Wonderful. You still have to pay for extra toppings. I was going to say. Heavens <laughs> <laughs> above. They're all kinds of, yes, very fine. Um, they're called phantom traffic jams when they are waves that flow backwards at 12 miles an hour. So, you're a mosquito, it starts raining heavily. Uh, what happens next? Umbrellas, they put umbrellas. On. <laughs> <laughs> Love the idea. They fly in the back to go out. Ah, oh, I love oh, it. Oh, delicious. Ah. Well, the problem, it's not hot. <laughs> the problem they face is that, a, that a one raindrop is 50 times heavier than they are. So you'd imagine they'd be knocked sideways by it. Good. Them. But yes, and yes. frankly, <laughs> good, bloody, bloody riddance, but this is what happens. They just brush them aside. Oh. Oh. And sometimes they actually ride on them. We actually annoyingly don't have film them riding on them. And then they leap off just before they hit the ground and burst. Oh. They're very sort of elegantly cope with them. Because they like that weather. So I genuinely <laughs> think that we have sleptwalked into being a mosquito nation. I don't remember mosquitoes. Gnats. Yes, swarms yeah. of gnats. Mosquitoes was something you experienced abroad. But now they say there's only one thing guaranteed if you're having a barbecue to keep the mosquitoes away from the food. That's hang a big bag of blood over by the neighbour's house. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, they'll always go that way. But I don't remember mosquitoes being in this country, and uh, no, I, well, I, I think the Daily Mail should look into it. Yes. You could obviously want to take the tube to stay nice and dry and avoid the problem of raindrops at all, but there is, in fact, a special subspecies of mosquito that lives only on the London Underground. Yeah? Yeah, and it bites rats, dogs and people, and it's called Culex pipiens molestus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not that big, don't worry. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I promise you. Would you like really a seat? Oh, Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> and they always just rats and I'm exhausted. <laughs> so, if it's raining, is it best to run into the dry or to walk slowly into the dry in order to be less wet? I've just realised how much of my life I've spent during, when it rains trying to work this out. Going, <laughs> if I run, am I running into yes, more raindrops? Exactly. That's or the point. if I walk, uh, so what's going to make me wetter? And by the time I've stopped and figured that out, I'm drenched. Yes. <laughs> you run, but you run sideways. Ah, you were just. Very narrow shape. You're absolutely on the money here, aren't you? Really? <laughs> if, is that right? If you are. If you're thin. So there are many, many variables. Pull your tummy in. Yeah. It's all been thought through by man for... So fat people get no. wet. No. Well... Fat people get wet. It's for a book. It is. Fat people, people get, get wet. Isn't it a... <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it a Randy Newman song? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's pro, a pro, fat people, people get wet. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Franco Bocci actually wrote a paper in the European Journal of Physics. It's a high-level physics. I time. love that journal. Yeah, it's one of the... <laughs> I mean, obviously, it was so sort of semi-jokey, but it, it covered all the points you've made. It recommended if the rain is falling straight down or being blown towards you by the wind, you should run as fast as you can until you reach shelter. If the wind is behind you, you should try and match the speed of the wind. <laughs> <laughs> if the wind is from the side, <laughs> fat people should run as fast as they can. <laughs> Whereas very thin people might be better off walking. <laughs> the math behind is apparently Pretty fiendishly if it's complex. If from the side, run as fast as you, you can. can. Yeah. It'd be it's pretty, pretty galling to be in that situation and see a mosquito surfing <laughs> past. <laughs> So, no, uh, do you remember when snails were faster? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. Oh. You probably do. You probably do incrementally by such a small amount. The fact no. is, yeah. They're slowing down. They're, snails are slowing down. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's like that awful joke about the builder who turns around and stamps on a snail. Says, that bastard's been following me around all day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the snail knocks on the door and the bloke kicks it out and he goes, throws it away and about two days later he hears bing bong and he goes to the door and the snail goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> but they do, apparently, if you throw them away, they do make their way back to, uh, to where you flung them from. 
I'm sure I read that. I'm sure someone painted You're up some... of cats. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. You're yes. thinking grandparents. <laughs> <No>. Grandparents. <laughs> No, I'm no, sure. But I'm you are right about shells. And of course, they're the easiest animals on earth to mark, actually, and, mm. yeah. because of the shells. So, um, some scientists from Chile took the common garden snail, and what they did on each one is they measured their metabolism by the amount of CO2 they emitted at rest. And then they released them into the wild, and then later they went out and found some dead ones and some still living ones. And they found that the size of the snails had no effect on their survival and thriving rates, but the metabolic rate did. So the lower the snail's metabolic rate, the greater the chance of survival. It seems that nature is selecting for snails with a slower metabolism, giving it more time to do that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. That's lazy. That is lazy. That's all he wants. Are they slowing down because they've taken up smoking? Is that why they're... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good point. Jeez, I think it's, a it's evolutionary pressure is slowing them down, as it I were, think... so selecting them for snails. I think I read somewhere that they were the first things we farmed. Do you know, I think that rings a bell. I have a feeling they were the first things we farmed because... Uh, well, because they're relatively easy to farm. I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's a quiet day for a snail shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> I would think. But, uh, but they found evidence from very, very early man that, that we'd... Found them. That we'd yeah. found them, yeah. Absolutely yeah. right. In fact, we covered this, didn't we? And do you remember Dim Memory Story? Oh, well, that, that, we did. That's yeah. what's happened with QI now. Yeah, yeah. You'll have people like me coming and going, I'm sure I heard something. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think where the hell it was. <laughs> So, uh, if you want to catch a snail, there's no hurry. The longer you leave it, the slower it'll be going. Who are Europe's biggest swingers? <laughs> Germans. The Germans. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Could be a long ride. The Dutch. The Dutch. That's an interesting one. Don't, <laughs> don't <you? laughs> Damn and curses. <laughs> don't say any Scandinavian countries, whatever you do. <laughs> Very do you wise. you mean swingers like... That swing from things. I literally do. That yeah. uh, are married couples looking for some excitement. Cunning you! You have seen through our ploy. It is indeed the more literal former, i.e., people I who use that. swings in a sporting way. They have. I do about the other. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they have a national pastime which is called kiking or kiking. K double I K. Hungarians. Oddly enough, it's one of only two other countries that has a language which is based on the same language as Hungary. Iceland. No, Finland. No, there's, uh, Finland is one of them. It's Estonia. Bizarrely, Estonia. yeah. It's, oh. it's Estonia, Finland and Hungary are part of the Finno-Ugric linguistic I had a, a UKIP leaflet came through the door saying that's how they're going to get in, using big swings. <laughs> <laughs> all, all of them, apparently, the whole lot, they're all just going to swing in. <laughs> Well, they will take up space in our parks, swinging right. in a way that we've never seen before. Behold, right. kiyaking. They can swing better than we can. And you'll see something that we thought was impossible when we were children. You start off like that, you haven't got Daddy to push you. He's not going to go around the top, is he? He's not going to go over is the he? top. Surely he couldn't. <laughs> Look at that big leg well, thrust. Big leg thrust at just the right out. moment. Yeah. Hitting the resonance of the pendulum just at the right moment. He's been to see Matilda. Oops. <laughs> yeah, now he's higher. Come on, baby. There he goes. Yeah. Wow. a Rooney, and then nearly up then. So, that's the sport. Now, the, inter tremendous. the interesting thing is those, those arms, they are adjustable, so everyone has a go. When they've all done it at that height, you then extend the arms telescopically, oh, yes. bracket them up, and it's a bit like the high jump or something. All those who can't do it drop out until you've got a winner who's got the longest arm setting and has done a complete 360-degree turn. You'd have to raise turn. the height of the uh, axis, though, wouldn't you? <laughs> That'd be very important. Yes. Otherwise... <laughs> oh, I mean, it's, it's good to, it's, yeah. it's nice to win, but... <laughs> no. <laughs> Well put, absolutely. <laughs> they look uh, obviously immensely strong, and I imagine the thighs are very strong, getting that real yeah. kick in there, because they haven't got daddy I'm imagining pushing. the yeah. thighs now. <laughs> <laughs> Picture. Uh, immensely strong. They did. Their mates would push you, and, you'd oh. and they wouldn't stop. Oh, I know, and you yeah. screamed. Yeah, stop it. Have you <laughs> seen the one where, where kids put a moped on its side? And put the, but they put the back wheel of the moped against the bottom of the roundabout with some children on it, and then hit it. Yeah. And the... Oh. Oh, wow. my word. It's, it's one of those you can't look, but you also can't look away. <laughs> they start going, and then they're like, oh, this is... Oh, like this, and they come flying and off. The, oh, my God, the thing that happened that you thought would happen with the Earth. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And they say kids don't get out enough these days, but, but there they are on YouTube, being brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. New forms of torture for mm. their fellows. But I think the thing about taking kids to the swings yeah. is that it's a, such a weird mixture of incredibly stressful and really boring at the same time. <laughs> And they could break their neck, yeah. but yeah. most of the time they don't. And so you're just like standing there going, oh, God, I've been here half an hour, and it seems like, you know, a year. The other thing is if they fall over is the, the dog pool, you know, that oh, if they yeah. transfer it to their eyes, they go blind. I, I don't, you must see sand pits anymore. It's all of a sand pit. That was of always full of turds and junkies' needles as well. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> and dog, dog poo was chalky white, wasn't it? Yes, it's pure. Which it no longer is. That's, that's because the of the ingredients food. in the dog food, yeah. yeah. Well, and the length of time it's left out. Yes. Because now the people pick it up and put it in a bag and they... then put the bag back where the poo was anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Who's doing that? <laughs> Who are they? Who are those I... people? Or, or hang it from a tree? Yes. <laughs> okay. I tried to believe that, that bagged poo grows on trees. <laughs> explain it to... No wonder ash trees have surrendered. Yes. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Most oh, unfortunate. Oh. Anyway, the Estonians have taken swinging right over the top. Now, what happened to most of the people in Pompeii when Vesuvius erupted? <laughs> yes, Marcus. Uh, well, they they choked on the dust and gases, uh, and uh, but they were sort of set in dust before anything else touched them. No. no. <laughs> Most of them got away. Is the right answer? Yes. Ah. Uh, the, very good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A jolly, encouraging, and patronising round of applause to you. <laughs> 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 no, you're absolutely right. Spot on. Uh, Estimates are about. Get all my patronising rounds of applause. <laughs> are you late? Do you add them all together? together? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it would probably tilt the earth off its axis. <laughs> uh, around 1,100 bodies were found at Pompeii, but uh, at least 15,000 people, which is 83% of the population, escaped. But we know one person who did not escape, don't we, Alan? Who, who out of his natural curiosity, sat down on a chair and tied a pillow to his head with a napkin and watched it and then suffocated. Yes. And his name was your old friend Pliny. Pliny! Hooray! You love Pliny. It's always Pliny. It's the always Pliny. <laughs> the elder, more yes, not his. Pliny the yeah, elder. Not, not Pliny the younger. Ooh, Certainly not oh. Pliny the wise. <laughs> 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 yes, but most of the ones you've seen of those bodies frozen, as it were, by the ash, actually had holes in them as their flesh corrupted within. And when they were discovered, it was deemed a neat idea to inject them with plaster of Paris. Mm. So almost all the ones you've seen are probably casts, or indeed casts of casts, because there are probably at least a dozen of those around the world in different museums. But they're a ah. you know, perfect representation. Did you ever see it with the original cast? It's fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> it's fabulous. Very good. Now then, what's the world's highest waterfall? Let's say it has the longest drop. Is it in South America? No. Not an Angel Falls. Is it Angel oh. Oh. oh, no, I've... <laughs> Soiled my clean sheet. <laughs> 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 um, what a tragedy. It is. Its drop is 11,500 feet. Angel Falls is only 3,212 feet. But you think, well, well, what is it called then? What's its name? The weird thing is it doesn't have a name. Oh. It's actually underwater. Underwater. Ah. Between Greenland and Iceland. Why does it count as a waterfall, though, because when there's it is... loads of water there anyway? No, because it's a huge current of cold water dropping down, and it is a waterfall well, within of water. in Iceland, all the other water's warm, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, it's well, well, warm. By comparison, exactly. very, yeah. it's why the ice cap disappearing matters, because the ice cap is incredibly cold water, which is then very dense, and it drops very fast to the, to the ocean bed, which draws warm water up mm. straight past us. If that process stops, then instead of being two or three degrees warmer and having peach trees on our lawn, we will actually ah, probably exactly. sink back You've into an ice You've been talking to David Attenborough. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been, I've been there. I went, I went with a research vessel. And one of the best things that happened on that trip, we reached the uh, east coast of Greenland and went into a fjord, and they wanted to sort of film me floating between icebergs. And I, I, I got in this survival suit and got in the sea, and as I was climbing down the ladder, this guy says, oh, there's a seal in the water. And I thought, oh, that's good. It'll make the film really exciting, brilliant. And as I let go of the ladder like this, uh, you can hear him say, oh, no, hang on, that's not a seal, it's a bear. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see on the oh, no, this, 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 this mother bear, mercifully, <laughs> with two bear. cubs on her back, otherwise she'd yeah. have been a lot quicker, is going across the bay like this, and then she goes... <laughs> In my, direction. Feed. in my ah. direction, well, indeed, but that's... that's. I must brick stock my larder. Exactly. That's, that's why she was crossing what would have been a, a frozen fjord. She was looking for any ice on which she could hunt and feed those cubs, and then oh. we watched her climb a mile or so up and down into the next fjord to find that that one isn't frozen either. Oh, God, so, God. yes, very, very bleak Wind. and very beautiful and uh, amazing. But yeah. this, this, this doesn't have a name, right? No, weirdly, it doesn't. The QI waterfall. The QI oh, waterfall. Yes. The Alan Davis mm. <laughs> waterfall. The Alan Davis cascade. <laughs> That'd be a good name, wouldn't yeah, it? Now you're talking. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's a haircut as well, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> um, and you're also a physician. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear, dear. Uh, this... Can't do it anymore, I need support. <laughs> the unnamed QI waterfall it carries at least 175 million cubic feet of cold water per second. It's the equivalent of 2,000 Niagara's at peak flow. Whoa. Yeah. So, what's the world's biggest river? Where is it? Is it underwater? <laughs> oh. That's a nice thought. <laughs> oh. Amazon. 
No! Oh, no, no, what? no, 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 <laughs> no. He said biggest. Yeah. What do you mean? Widest, longest? Uh, carries most, the most water. Carries the most well, water. You're going to be so angry. It's in the sky. They're called atmospheric rivers. Oh, oh. oh no. I've got to say, sometimes on behalf of the audience, <laughs> I hate this program. I, <laughs> I agree. I agree. I'm really. This is hurting you far more than it hurts me. No, um, they're known as atmospheric rivers. They're vast ribbons of water vapour moving water around the world. They appear in different places, different times. Are they the ones that long. are perfectly timed to coincide with bank holidays? Yes, that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly that right. Yeah. They're the ones. 2,000 kilometres long and uh, only a few kilometres wide. But although they cover less than 10% of the globe, four or five of them contain 90% of all the world's water vapour at one time. So the world's biggest rivers are in the sky. All right, I'm sorry about that. But seriously, name the world's biggest river that isn't in the sky. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, An actual isn't in the sky. No, that isn't in the sky. Yeah. Is it one but of those the... ones that, that Alan's mentioned already, do you think, maybe? No, oh. there is a river under the Amazon called the Rio Hamza, and it is actually bigger than the Amazon itself. It's only discovered in 2011. The Rio Hamza. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hamza. Is it sort of hook oh. show? <laughs> <laughs> A very sad coincidence, I'm afraid. The um, river hated by the tabloids. <laughs> hated by the tabloids. <laughs> yes. Um, they collected data from 241 abandoned deep wells, and it runs 6,000 kilometres, like the Amazon above it, uh, but it's up to four times wider. Uh, and the, um, oh. that's 200 to 400 kilometres wide. How far down is it? Four kilometres beneath the Amazon itself. I mean, some people would say it's an aquifer, but it actually flows horizontally like a river. So oh. it's, and it is called the Hio, which is river. The things live in it? There's it always something, isn't there? Usual. No matter how crap a place is, yeah. Attenborough always goes, even here. <laughs> <laughs> something very stupid. But something comes up. He's <laughs> built his house. <laughs> it doesn't talk. matter. The Muppet. He'd go yeah. anywhere, wouldn't he? <laughs> 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 Muppet. Yeah. 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 A little light on his head. <laughs> 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 It's true. And here they are mating. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely true. So the biggest river that isn't in the sky is underground. So what's the world's biggest animal? Oh, Alan, don't get me started. Oh, it's, 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 it's the blue whale. It's the right eye! Poor oh. Alan. <laughs> 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 Oh, it's so I was allowed to say blue whale except me. <laughs> <laughs> it's the biggest uh, animal that's ever, ever existed. Lived bigger on, than on the earth. Right. Bigger any... than any dinosaur. Absolutely correct. <sighs> yeah. Magnificent. Tongue things. as big as a bus. And we know we know <laughs> we know so next to nothing about them. You're right. We don't know where they go or, or anything. They pop I know up where they go. I exactly I know anything about them. <laughs> <laughs> they go on the minus side of the debit, the ledger, don't they? Uh, yes, exactly. Tongues the size of a mini cooper. No, yep. they're hard. <laughs> oh poor Alan, it was so sorry for you. <laughs> But they are, no, they are mysterious and extraordinary and beautiful animals. Um, and they're huge. Oh, fuck. And let's see. <laughs> 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 uh, you tried. You me for years. You, you tried. <laughs> is what you oh, it is, of course, the blue whale. Don't you listen to anything? Now, we're going to end. How can you knock a building down with a feather? Mm. And, like the shard, for example. You could knock it down. I could knock it down, if I prepared things correctly, with it. A whisk of a feather. A very, very, not very, using any ele very, electronics. Very, very large feather. No, uh, using. I've actually got the feather here that I'm going to use. It's nice and pink, so it stands out. That would be the do feather you, I'd use. Do you tickle the architect while he's doing plans, <laughs> <laughs> so that they're all off? Like that. <laughs> it falls. Out. And then they make it. Oh, it didn't work. But Stephen was tickling him with a feather. <laughs> Cunning thought. Um, but no, this uh, is the existing standing shard. And you could reduce that to rubble with a feather. Yeah. Shall I show you? I'll show you the yes. principle. This is my little template to show me where I have to go. Let's see what I got done. Here, and here's my big. Oh, it's my big load. Oops. There, it, there we go. Now, what we've got here is, in varying sizes, kind of dominoes, you can see. Um, and the idea is that each one is just one and a half times bigger than the one before it. Um, and it may seem like a very little amount, but what we're going to do is make a really loud bang with what, this. Is that meant to be like the Dominoes, it's the domino effect. You it would aim this at the shards, yes. and you'd only need 24 of these. Each one just one and a half times bigger than the one before it. That's, that's the point. You bring it. The, you'd only need 24, and the last one would utterly really? destroy it. it be, it's the exponential <laughs> increase of mass, uh, <laughs> just by going one and a half times bigger. It's all right, it can only fall... Yeah. <laughs> I've got a splinter up in room now. <laughs> <laughs> careful, careful. Now, right, so here we go. We've just made the uh, security services job that much more harder. You can bring here down the shards. Here we go. <laughs> so <laughs> you imagine... Not <laughs> aircraft anymore. We're going to... QI's giving it away. So imagine <laughs> this increasing up to just 24. 
and you'd start with one movement of a feather and all the potential energy stored in these and all the mass of them like that and you just have that effect like whoa wow there you go where did you yeah. come by such a camp feather <laughs> The awesome thing was, I was asked to choose the colour, and I immediately went, I think this one stands out. <laughs> it is a lovely feather. There's a Come bird on. of paradise somewhere having a very problematic flirting scene. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, we've run out of energy for this week. Let's see the movement on the scoreboard. And, oh, my word, isn't it fantastic? Clear winner, I want to say, as always, because he's so brilliant, it's Danny Baker Thank with Plus very Eight. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you. In fantastic second place with minus five, Marcus Brigstock. Yeah, I know, I know. A very close third with minus eight, Joe Brand. You must have minus 40. Oh, poor wee soul with minus 56 in fourth place. <laughs> it's Adam <laughs> Marcus, Danny, Joe and Alan, and it's goodbye from me and adore each other. Good night.